Thanks, Pablo. So I am so sorry that this is a virtual congress because New York City is one of my favorite places. And I do have to declare that I do have some conscious biases and I'll do my best to work around those and not let them interfere with what I'm talking about. This is a very philosophical talk and there's going to be very little data, but just what I think when I look at a case of acetabular dysplasia. So first off, we've got a polling question. For developmental dysplasia of the hip in this 12-year-old girl who presents to me for the first time, simple question, would you operate? Yes or no? So while you're just thinking about that, what do I see when I look at the x-ray? Well, it's embarrassing that this is her first presentation and I live in a westernized country where I thought we were better at screening. So then if this is bilateral straightforward DDH, is that right? These hips look a little different from what I would normally call DDH. And therefore I'm looking at some various features. So obviously there is significant dysplasia. Obviously there is a huge break in Shenton's line. And I think the hips have quite valgus femoral necks. So I'm beginning to wonder if this is truly the old fashioned developmental dysplasia of the hip or something else. So would we operate or not? I've often been told that for bilateral bad cases like this over the age of seven or eight or six or whatever the conference decides, you should leave them alone. But I don't think that's right these days. So would you operate, yes or no? Do we have any answers, please? You're muted, Pablo, I can't hear you. Sorry about that. We do have some responses. So 88% of participants have said they would operate uh, versus 12% who have said they would not operate. Right. So given that you are going to operate, we should always take a really full history. And I didn't quite like the fact that her symptoms were of a limp and a bit of a waddle. And I just didn't like what I was seeing uh, on examination. So we did some tests. And so she is now diagnosed with hereditary sensory motor neuropathy. We did an arthrogram because I do like some dynamic imaging and we've got some reducible subluxations. So my second question is, assuming you would operate and we've got bilateral reducible subluxations, do we do left and right on the same day, above and below the hip joint on both, on both sides? Or would you prefer to do them staged as sequential procedures? So whilst you're looking at that question and perhaps answering it, what, what am I thinking? Well, I'm thinking that she's got a neurological condition. I know that if I immobilize her for too long, then she might weaken and her walking tolerance might be worse and that she might have difficulty rehabbing. And that's what her parents are very concerned about as well. We also know it's been one hell of a year and she's not just, she's lost a lot of time off school and is very keen to get back to school as soon as possible. So are these family factors, social environmental factors, are they important or are they not? And I think they are important. They don't override things, but they're things that I think help me decide when I'm going to pull the trigger. So same day, all four bones or staged? Pablo, what's our answers? Well, we're getting more and more responses in. It's consistently been 33%. So a third of people would do it on the same day and two thirds would do it as staged sequential procedures. Great, thanks. I'm glad the audience agrees with me. So we are aiming for staged sequential procedures. <laughs> Sorry, Pablo. So in answering those questions, I've tried to emphasize that to me, history is important, relating to the current symptoms, but also to her current diagnosis, and most particularly to the past treatments, and therefore your understanding or the surgeon's understanding of the pathology that is affecting that hip. So this young girl does have a developmental dysplasia of the hip, but I'm not sure that it's our classic one. It's more influenced by her neurological condition, but that's hypothesis. We know that though we have to think about the timing. So my question to my more adult colleagues was, should I wait until the triradiate is closed to do a PAO? Because do you believe that the PAO is significantly better than the triple? Or should I go right ahead and do the triple? And also, I want to know when her last procedures were. Now, in this case, there were no previous procedures. And I also think having the family on board is really important, as, as do all of you. But I just want to mention that because this is an art and a science of trying to know when to pull the trigger. So when do I do an acetabular osteotomy? I hope when the time is right, judged by 
when the hip is failing to improve in the way I expect it to radiographically, or in fact worsening clinically and or on x-ray. Because the treatment I am instigating is to alter the natural history and to improve current symptoms, and hopefully both. Or maybe if she's got no symptoms, all I'm doing it for is to alter the natural history. So the indications for your surgical intervention may influence the risks you're prepared to take. And that's going to be an individual basis with you and your parents. So let me start with the hip that you know really well. This is a child who presented to you promptly with her DDH. She had successful early treatment. She's now got some residual dysplasia with or without some subluxation. And there may be that lump sign of the uncovered femoral head in the groin, which I think is quite an important sign. It may be getting progressively worse over time or simply failing to improve. So when do you pull that trigger? So there are some differences between the Americans and the uh, Europeans in terms of what we look for on the X-ray. The acetabular angle is important to both of us and Shenton's line perhaps a little bit more important in North America than in, in, in Europe, but only just a little bit. And what we have to remember is that the bony acetabular index improves markedly over the first four years of life in the normal hip, but the acetabular cartilage, uh, sorry, the cartilaginous acetabular index stays more or less the same. We do know that after any particular treatment, it takes time for your acetabulum to change. It may not take that long when you're treating a pavlic harness. And if I do a closed reduction, for a DDH, and that's my on-table arthrogram, and I accept that position, then six weeks later, I've got a much better cartilaginous acetabular index, but the bony acetabular index has had no time yet to improve. So when do I start feeling that something has to happen? Well, this paper from quite a while ago now would say that at two years post-reduction, you could still expect some improvement but by four years, there's gonna be no difference between what you've got at four years and what you've got at six years. So maybe if you've had the child since early age, then if the hip is not improving as you expect it to be, then you should be treating before school age. What about the hip that is new to you? It may be bearing scars of previous treatments or not, as in the case of the case I presented earlier. And these scars may be on the acetabular side, but also on the femoral side. We've looked at that in earlier talks. So the hip that is new to you, these two different hips, what is the prognosis? And is it the same for both patients? And I would like to think that it isn't. So therefore you've got to think carefully as to which hip deserves which treatment. In answer to the question about what sort of imaging, we can have static, but I do like my dynamic imaging. And up until now, the MRI has not yet been able to give me the dynamic imaging that I would like. So this hip with its die in the joint outlines a reducible subluxation and shows me that the acetabulum is indeed quite dysplastic. And the femoral neck is perhaps not as bad as we thought earlier. We've got to beware the long leg and the stiff hip. And I would ask you that any time a hip comes to see you, you ask for the history of the treatment and you go back in time, right back to the beginning if you're interested in the pathology, to try and work out whether this was a true dislocated hip or simply a dysplastic and subluxed hip when it started. It may not influence your management just now, but it will add to your learning of how hips behave. And then lastly, there is the hip that has now come under your control. It's had residual dysplasia, multiple previous procedures, the doctor-patient relationship may well be a little fraught, and there may not be much faith maintained in the medical prof pro profession, and their expectations of what you can achieve may be unrealistic. So be very careful in diagnosing what the problem is now. A lot of previous treatment, residual subluxation dysplasia, and a long leg, long leg. Can you solve it? And please remember that teenage years and indeed teenage hips are full of angst, and now may not be quite right time to be doing anything too much. Now, what about stable dysplasia? We recognize this concept in the infant, but what about in the child? This young lady of 14 is entirely asymptomatic. I cannot persuade her to have a symptom. She's a cross-country champion. 
and the MRI shows a congruent hip with no labral tear. Shenton's line is beautiful, and that acetabular index has not changed since aged five. I know I should do something, but am I aiming for excellence, or is perfectly okay, perfectly okay? Should we treat the hip before it fails, but how hard do I push this particular family to work out what the problem is? So when do I pull the trigger? When I'm concerned clinically, and when I'm concerned radiographically. Thank you very much.